hi, everyone. And hi, Jason. Thank you so much for joining us Hello. today. We're really excited to have you. Thanks for having me. We're going to have a great conversation today about building great leaders. And um, I'm going to start off with Jason asking him a bunch of questions. But before we came up here, um, I also let him know that I love to have interaction from all of you. So even though I have questions that I want to ask him, I would give them all up if all of you would ask him questions instead. So we have Jennifer walking around, and I think Stuart walking around with mics. Please look for them, raise your hand, and we'll come get you so that you can actually ask Jason uh, some good questions that I probably don't have on my list, OK? Uh, so that's, we'll start there. Great. Thanks. And uh, so let's do background. Let's start there and uh, just kind of give us a roadmap of how you got to uh, CarGurus, sure. how you're the CFO of CarGurus, and also talk about a little bit about the background of CarGurus, because they're just growing like crazy. And so, we are, yep. yeah. Sure. So uh, thank you, and thank you for having me, and, and it's great to be here today. Uh, so I began my career in consulting. I uh, was actually an English major in undergrad, and uh, was deciding between trying to write screenplays, which my mom loved that idea, <laughs> and going into consulting, and my dad loved that idea, so he won. Uh, so when it went to Bain and had a terrific three years there, got exposure to you know, they call it the Bain Toolkit, but, but all elements of strategy and operations consulting. Uh, missed the feeling of really being part of a team, and this was back in the late 90s, and uh, the internet boom was, was beginning, and so uh, was drawn to a company called Aquaniv, which was a digital media services and technology company competing with DoubleClick at the time. Uh, joined them, and we rode the roller coaster. We went, went public on Leap Day 2000, uh, at an enormous multi-billion dollar valuation on not much revenue and, and significant losses. Uh, and then, you know, we're worth less than cash in our balance sheet about four months later. Uh, so it was a great experience, built a, a pretty sizable team there. Uh, and then uh, went to business school and thought that in part, went to Tuck, and thought in part that uh, it, that would be a good ground to, you know, further my skill set, but also perhaps transition into an investing role, because what I valued at Bain was the breadth. What I valued at Aquaniv was working with a team and investing and, and uh, you know, putting your money where your mouth is and serving on boards seemed like a great combination of the two. So I uh, did some early stage venture work, but then joined Polaris, where I focused on high growth tech companies that were established. They weren't early stage. So these were typically bootstrap companies. So we would work with entrepreneurs that had founded and grown businesses to anywhere from 10 to 50 million of revenue and were growing. And, uh, and we would help them scale with, we would help them scale with capital, but we would also help them scale as board members. And really, uh, you know, I think the two things that as investors uh, you can do to help grow a company is you can provide them with pattern recognition of you know, when these other three companies went through these stages of growth, here's what they encountered, and let's help you avoid those. And then the second thing you can do is provide access to a network. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when they are embarking on a particular project or, or a particular scaling challenge, you can say, well, you should go talk to this, this woman because they just went through that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so invested for 12 years and, and loved it, had a great run. And then uh, through sort of a, a series of, of odd, uh, you know, connections and circumstances learned about CarGurus, which uh, we had met with them when uh, the founder was beginning the company in 2006. They didn't take any venture capital, so neither we nor anyone else invested. Uh, and, you know, fast forward uh, nine years later, this was 2015, as I got to know the company and saw what they were doing, it, I, I was blown away. I'd, I'd been hunting for growing tech companies for 12 years and, and had never seen one that was growing this fast at this scale uh, with this financial profile. It was, it was profitable. And so really decided to make a career change. And, and I think you know the sort of pendulum swung back to some of my feelings from years earlier where I wanted to just get deeper into a company. And uh, it was the combination of that exciting profile that I mentioned, uh, the team certainly, and the strategic position of the company, but also just how, the, how much building needed to be done. And so sometimes I'll use this as, exam as an example, and if people in the non-financial environment don't sort of fully grok this, but when I got there, we had one, we were a 70 million trailing revenue business. Uh, we were on QuickBooks. We had uh, one person that had accounting experience. We had four people in billing. 
and we had one person who did sort of all things HR, and we were 150 people, uh, and we wanted to go public. And so <laughs> they there can was do that it. Too. Oh, and, and the next month after I joined, we were out of office space. Uh, so, so it was just a, it, it had, you know, sort of the, the nuts and bolts building, you know, grassroots that needed to be done, as well as a whole strategic picture that needed to be fleshed out. Because when I asked about the product strategy, uh, I was told that we're going to go into another number of other countries. I said, that's great, that's, that's a geography strategy, but what's the product strategy? And the sentiment at the time was, it was an engineering-led environment, and they said, you know, we can't plan far ahead because we're gonna test and iterate and we're not sure what's gonna work, which is a, a fine philosophy, but over time, it needs to be balanced with some longer-range planning. So, the, 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 so, needless to say, I jumped in, and uh, it's been an incredible two and a half years. So it was 150 people when I joined. We're 650 now. Uh, we did go public in October last year. Uh, we uh, actually exciting milestone. So last quarter, we did the same amount of revenue we did in 2015. Uh, so we've grown very fast, That's profitably, That's and uh, and if and I can tell you why we're better than the competition. If we <laughs> And actually, when I was learning about him, I had said to him, well, you're the second largest. And he goes, no, 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 we're the first. And I, that just, that was like, you know, in no time. So, um, and, and that's, you know, scaling so quickly and starting with such a small group and then growing so big. How do you make sure that the leaders that you have, how are you building those leaders so that you're scaling well and you're scaling strong? Yeah, yeah. So s scaling, we face scaling challenges literally every day. I was in two meetings this morning that were specifically addressing ways in which we're not scaling uh, well enough to meet the needs of the business. Mm -hmm. But you know, we think about it as you have to hire and train leaders at various levels of the business and in various areas of the business. And then you need to provide the culture and the infrastructure to support their growth. Uh, and each of those components, hiring leaders, training leaders, building the culture, and investing in the systems are pretty significant work streams in their own right, but, but that's our approach to it. Yeah. When you're building that team or you're bringing on those new people, I always wonder, do you look for, always, I was thinking about this, do you look for the leaders as you're hiring, or is it that you're looking around and you're saying, that person has something? And then where does that perspective come from? Is it just from you, or do you have a team that's looking at that and figuring it out? Because I know we had talked and you said, you really need to you build the company that builds the leaders, right? Yeah, so, so uh, we, we actually, I think, for 70% of our roles, are targeting what we call just good athletes. Mm -hmm. People who can be utility players and would be good at a number of things. And the, the traits of those people, and, and so they may not have experience in the role they were doing. I didn't have experience as a CFO. Uh, so I'm, a, I, I'm an example of that. Uh, in our product organization, we're hiring people that haven't run product before. Uh, but um, we're looking for intellectual curiosity, mm -hmm. We're looking for utility capabilities, and we're looking for the ability for people to scale up and scale down. And so by that, we mean that uh, someone in the course of a conversation could elevate to talking about our competitive strategy or some of our market dynamics, but then go down to have the ability to, not to have the answers, but to have the ability to then go down to the level of talking about unit economics. Hmm. and. When we find that when people can can scale up and down like that, uh, they can they're they're far more efficient at solving problems. The other thing that that is an indicator for is that, and and I'll go back to the numbers I said before. If you think about us hiring someone when we were 150 people, they may have and let's say it was a manager, they may have had a team of three at the time. Mm. Well, today they probably have a team of. 12 uh, or 15. Or in the case of GNA, we had about six people and now we have a little over 60. And so we try and hire for people who are going to sort of fit in that job in about 18 months. And 
that's hard to do because you really you need to do a pretty good selling job because that person needs to accept that they're going to maybe take a step back or maybe have a much smaller team than they had, but in due time, if they buy into the vision of the company and the growth potential, they'll not only have that team of 15, but it'll then be a team of 30, and they'll learn along the way. So uh, that's what we look for in most of our candidates. Mm. I have also subscribed a little bit to a concept. Uh, I, I noticed that the title earlier was a, a radical CFO. There's a book called Radical Candor, uh, which is a good read on, on uh, how managers can be effective in being just honest with their team members. And they talk about rock stars and superstars. Mm. And uh, a rock star is somebody who is outstanding in their role, but doesn't want to you know, keep getting promoted and maybe doesn't want to manage people. But they're just fantastic, critical member of the team, couldn't, couldn't live without them. And then there are superstars who do want to elevate and, and manage and do more. And you have to, and, and both people have roles in almost every team in a company. And you have to be able to uh, you know, provide a great environment for both types of people. Right. And perfect segue. So when you have that great environment, what exactly is there what certain things that your company does or has put in education or any type of, you know, leadership education or things like yep. that so that you know they bought into it, you know that they're, it's probably going to happen, but, you know, there's other people that come into the company. So how do you make sure that you're retaining those superstars? Sure. So the one of the first things we had to do, and again, this is an example of just none of this existed uh, two years ago, is we wanted to define a vision for the company, and we wanted to define a set of values for the company. And so uh, these, these things sound simple or, or you know, stupid or silly, but they're, they're quite powerful. And so we developed a vision, which is to build the world's most trusted and transparent automotive marketplace. And we had a, a reason why each word was in there, why it was build and not create, and mm. why it was trusted and transparent and so forth. Uh, we then, and, and that is on a, you know, index card size stock piece of paper on everybody's desk now. Uh, and we right. defined a set of values. Uh, and this, this had a lot of debate, uh, but we ended up with uh, six values that we're pioneering, transparent, data-driven, collaborative, we move quickly, and we work with integrity. Definitely. And uh, again, those could be perceived as pie in the sky. Uh, we tried hard to not make them that. And we also acknowledge the fact that we're not all of those things right now. And I just held a, a session with, with my team to discuss as a group of 50 or 60 folks what do we think we're good at among these values now, and what do we think we're not good at and still need to aspire to? That's and, uh, and so these are, some are aspirational, some are core to us. And those help uh, between the vision and defining some of the strategy and setting the values, that helps put a frame around the culture that we're trying to create. We communicate those a lot, we over communicate those, and we reward against those. Mm -hmm. So now every quarter at our town hall, all hands meeting, uh, employees are awarded, and it's a big deal, it's monetary and it's big recognition around our values, it's demonstration of those values. So I'd say that's the first thing we do because it gives people uh, a common purpose. Right. Uh, the second thing we do is we are now starting to invest heavily in learning and development. Excellent. And uh, that's something that, to be honest, you know, different organizations feel differently about. Some don't invest in it much at all, others are you know, far more advanced than we are. A great quote, I heard about it, uh, or a great quote that I've heard about it from someone that may be in the crowd, actually, I'm not sure if he's here today, was someone who, not at our company, but who questioned a uh, company's investment in training, said, well, what happens if we train all these employees and they leave? And the head of training said, well, well, what happens if we don't and they stay? Um, and so we started to invest in learning and development, and that has four, uh, four areas to it. One is training around just the company, the culture, and the products. The second is around role mastery and skill development, so helping them do their job better. Um, the third is around career progression. And then the last one is around uh, leadership development. And leadership development is the one that is, the, the, the first couple are sort of your stock training. It's almost like your onboarding. We, we, people go through two weeks of training when they join us. 
uh, but it's leadership development that's getting the most attention right now. And the reason is because, and I think a lot of companies that grow fast will experience this, when you're growing fast, you need to make battlefield promotions all the time. And you also do want to maintain the culture, and so you're not going to hire in all your managers from outside. So right. converse to what I said earlier, where you want to hire people for the role that it's going to be in 18 months. Sometimes you just need to promote someone. And in areas like sales and, and engineering in particular, which are our two biggest groups, uh, someone who's a great salesperson yeah. may not be a great manager. And someone who's <laughs> a great developer, a star developer, may not even want to manage right. at all, let alone be good at it. Uh, and so what we found is, is we sort of looked up after growth from 150 to probably 300 and realized that about 70% of our managers, so anyone who was managing someone else, uh, were a first-time manager. And they had gotten there because they'd done so well in the prior role, but they did not have the skills necessary for training. So we would get feedback like, I've never had a one-on-one -on -one with my manager. Mm. Well, that's obviously a problem. And, and in some cases, that may be because the manager is not effective at communicating, and that needs to be uh, you know, changed or improved, or they shouldn't be managing. But in other cases, they just didn't know. They, they, you know the manager was a first-time manager. They were very busy. They didn't know they were supposed to have one-on-ones. Mm -hmm. So we're investing a lot of time there uh, to really teach people how to manage because as we scale, teams are getting bigger fast. Right. And the skills needed to manage a three-person team are wildly different than a 20-person team. Yeah, and probably some of those managers had no idea that, wow, I was really good at the three, but boy, I'm totally overwhelmed, right? Totally overwhelmed, and they may not have even been good at the three yeah. to start. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and it, and it really does matter when you have to be as efficient as your company has to be because you're growing so quickly. Absolutely, yep. yeah. Which um, kind of brings me to the next whole thing, really, which is the whole idea of the culture now, right? So now you have, you're building all of this, and um, how do you, you've mentioned a couple of things, and that's really where we get to it, but how do you build the culture and the infrastructure so that it's really a good solid ground that you're on and it's seen. Mm -hmm. So people coming into the company, people who are growing in the company at the pace that you guys grow, how do you keep it solid? It's very, very hard. And yeah. I would say we're, we're doing a, a, a B plus job right now. Uh, maybe even less um, because it's so hard. So it's, uh, it's, it's, over communicating, it mm -hmm. really is uh, keeping messages consistent and over communicating them uh, and having the systems that facilitate over communication. I mean, one thing we, we struggle with is we hear from employee feedback that they want more cross departmental communication. And so we began a process where departments would uh, produce a, once a month, they would produce a summary that would get sent around an email and email's not read by most engineers. They're mostly on Slack. And so we needed a forum in which to distribute that on Slack too, and, but then it would get lost in Slack. And so some people instead wanted to use the wiki. And so we then <laughs> needed to figure out how to get it on the wiki. And meanwhile, this has been communicated in town halls and so forth, and it just wasn't resonating. So, so it's over communicating and doing it in a way that is going to be heard by everyone mm -hmm. at the right cadence. Uh, I think that's the first thing. And then I think the second thing is uh, rewarding the right type of behavior and highlighting the right type of behavior. And, and both of those things need to be, they must be exemplified by the senior team. Absolutely. But then equally as important, or probably more important, is it then needs to, to get reiterated and echoed by every manager of every team. Mm -hmm. And right now, and this, this is linked to inexperienced managers, right now we're finding that it, for us, we think it occurs well, the senior leadership team and at the VPs to their team, and then it starts to break down a little mm -hmm. bit. Uh, and so we're working hard on training the directors and managers and so forth, um, but also just finding the right m modes of communication. Yeah. Not an easy thing to do, especially, and then you keep adding, so there's, there's more to worry about as you're, right? Or there is. We add, we're adding about 20 employees a month. That's uh, incredible. We have, uh, we now are out of, so we opened a second Boston office and 
we're going to soon run out of space there, so we need wow. to solve that. Uh, we also have an office in Dublin because we operate in we operate in Canada, the UK, Germany, and we just launched Italy. But our European operations are out of Dublin, so we've got a 45, 50 person office there, uh, and then we've got uh, a small office in, in Detroit and about 20 people in the field. So we're we're really we're relatively centralized for a company of our scale, but uh, but even being six blocks apart, uh, maybe even less, even three, four blocks apart. Uh, for about 300 people each has created some cultural challenges for us. I was just going to say, just because you have your little, you know, there's, there's real walls up, real separation between. So to have the modeling occur that makes it easy to understand, you have to make sure that you have the right models in each of the buildings that comes from, I guess, wherever that culture is on the foundation. And then that's tough. Yeah. It is. Yeah. It is. I mean, and, and so we're, we're, about to invest pretty significantly in much better video conferencing to just yes. increase communication between our two Boston offices and but more more importantly for Dublin so that it's just one click as some people can be on the phone or on email and say you know let's go video and you walk over and you each hit a single button and it's HD connectivity uh, because that is really important because you know we have a concern that that Dublin may develop a, a different culture than we want. And so sure. we were thoughtful about sending expats over to try and instill our culture there, but you can't do that forever. And so over time, we, we just hired a leader uh, of that office who's, who's Irish and has never worked in, at Cargers in the States. Yeah, yeah. Thank God for technology. Yes, although <laughs> it, it, video conferencing never works. It's just somehow I don't understand yeah. how it never works. Yeah. So, um, I don't know if I thought I saw a hand up. There was a light in my eyes. Was there any hands up before I keep going? OK. Um, so we have financial executives in the room, CFOs mostly in the room. How, you know, we talk about building this up, and you, know, you have all these people. And a lot of times when you're thinking about training and you're thinking about you know, growing your leaders and all of that, you really think HR. You think you know, other managers that manage to help train because it's soft skills, so you think. But we know that the better the leaders are, the more efficient and effective the company is because you're just more productive because that's what's happening, right? You're getting people. So as a CFO, how, how is it different for a CFO to be that leader? And what do you do maybe differently? And maybe nothing, I don't really know. But what maybe is different that what you do or what you think about compared to? Because you're thinking about your whole team, not just the financial team, but all leaders in your company. Is there something different that you might do? Uh, well, if I think about GNA, I guess, and GNA for us is uh, financial planning and analysis is one group, finance and accounting, people and talent, corporate development, and investor relations, and, and legal. So that's our, our GNA bucket. Uh, and, and at a high level, what, what we try and do is facilitate the growth of the company by eliminating any, any impediments for engineering and product to build products and sales and marketing to sell those products. And so we play a role of, of what I think is stability and facilitation. Uh, so as the CFO, I think of my efforts or my time spent into, into a few areas. The first is making sure that the finance and accounting is rock solid. Right. And that's one of those things where if, if you get it right, nobody notices. If you get it wrong, everybody does. And so we just have to get that right, and we have to instill that confidence in everyone else in the company so that they know that we'll get it right. They never need to worry about it. Uh, the second piece is around operations and uh, ensuring that uh, the right people at the company are talking to the, the right other people at the company so that uh, operationally we don't hit major hiccups. And again, that's in the need to have, don't ever want to worry about it, you know, same category for those first two. Uh, the third is around a growth strategy and, you know, I guess more pejoratively forecasting, but, but really uh, having a, a grip on where the company's going so that the odds that there's a surprise are very slim. Mm -hmm. and, in, and in doing that well, and I think we've invested uh, very wisely, but, but pretty aggressively in financial planning and analysis. We're also building a data analytics team. 
if, if you do that well, then anxiety levels go down and people can do their jobs better because they know what to expect and they know what's gonna come and they know what they're working toward. And they also, you also identify gaps and you know where you need to improve, but, but you just know what you need to do. Uh, and then the fourth is just being a, a sort of a corporate leader and being visible in that respect. And, and in that last category, I would say that should be no different, frankly, than the CEO or the head of marketing or, mm -hmm. or anybody else, but it's, it's being a, an individual, uh, a colleague, a, a friend, a mentor, whatever it is uh, that is able to inspire the company to work hard because we really need them to work hard. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, one of the common themes that we were talking about, because of course this is all about leadership, is you know really getting out there, and you just said it, that you know your people really know who you are and you know who they are. So being out there and knowing who they are and understanding them as a human, not so much just their title or something like that, but really knowing them. So I would imagine that happens a lot throughout your company, just because you were small and now you're so big. It was probably something that, that's probably one of those cultural things, right? That it started as a foundation, so it, it grows. It is, but it gets harder, a yeah. lot harder. Yeah. And so now, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, most times when I get in the elevator now, I have to introduce myself because I don't know, know the people. That's and, amazing. And the first common question is, you know, how long have you been here? And it's joined two months ago. And it's when you, and you hear someone that says they joined nine months ago and you're still shaking their hand for the first time, yeah. you Ooh. feel a little bad, but yeah. you know, it's, it's just a fact of scale. Right. Yeah. And then, you know, I, I was thinking too about your princ the principles that you were talking about when we first started talking. And I wonder, you know, I started thinking about KPIs. Like, is that all part of, like, the KPIs? And so everyone really knows, you know, that's all established within that? Yeah, so that was a big leap forward that we had this year. Uh, again, in the spirit of where we were, where, we, where we've come to, uh, you know, in, in 2015, the company didn't really have a forecast or strategic initiatives. In 2016, we had established some strategic initiatives. In 2017, we established strategic initiatives with objectives and metrics set against them. Uh, we had five that year. And, uh, and this year, for the first time, uh, we have, again, five strategic initiatives for 2018. Each one has about three objectives, and those objectives are each tied to a set of one or two metrics, and everybody in the company knows what those metrics are. And everybody in the company has those metrics on their desk. That's excellent. And now, again, part and parcel with that, everybody in the company, in some, to some order of magnitude, their bonus is tied to our achievement of those strategic initiatives, in addition to our financial performance. But uh, you know, as an example, uh, you know, executives are more heavily weighted to the cor corporate financial performance and right. the corporate strategic initiatives, and a reasonably small amount of our bonus is dependent on uh, personal achievement uh, or independent um, uh, performance, individual performance rather. Uh, and then for individual contributors, a much larger piece is based on individual performance, but they have some pieces tied to the strategic initiatives. And we've gone through an exercise to say, you know, for every, hopefully, and this is where we're relying on managers throughout the company to actually execute on this, but hopefully every manager has sat down with their teams to say, okay, you know, billing team, uh, you know, sort of implicitly, while you as a billing team may not feel particularly strategic, let's understand the different objectives that we can support. And lo and behold, customer retention is one of those. Well, if we do a great job billing, that's going to not drive away customers. If we do a poor job billing, customers are gonna get frustrated and churn's gonna go up. So uh, we've tried to tie every single person to the metrics that that they can influence. That's great. And then so it's a constant conversation. It's not something that happens, you know, six months because as you were saying, whether it's part of your bigger groups that you're having the conversation at your um, monthly or it's, meetings or? Yeah, I would say it's, it's a quarterly, mm -hmm. it's an explicit quarterly discussion for most people. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there are, we have teams, if we stick with retention for a second, I mean, yeah. we have a team that's focused, a cross-functional team. They have day jobs, but uh, that is focused on retention, and they're talking about it every day. Right. But in, in the billing team example, 
the, the connections are not always exceptionally direct connections, and mm -hmm. so you, need, you can't do it too much. Right. And, and talking about, uh, you said retention, I know you're thinking about customers, and I'm thinking retention within your um, staff and yep. your employees. I'm sure it's almost like a buy-in, right? So the more they know, we talked about transparency before and how much they know and how much do they buy in, because management is one thing, right? And, and then as you're bringing other people in and then you're growing them to be leaders because you're looking at them, um, retaining your people, is it with the growth, is it better to be as transparent and making them buy in? And I mean, I, maybe that's a dumb question or pretty obvious, but I just wonder, you know, how much of them owning it keeps them staying with you? If you will. Yeah, we, w so transparency is probably our most prevalent value. Mm -hmm. And so we consider ourselves exceptionally transparent. We, you know, went through a phase recently where we went public. And so there was that period where we could be particularly not transparent. And now that we are public, we're, st we're still, uh, we're still finding our groove on what is the right level to share with employees at various levels. Uh, but we are trying to toe the line to be as transparent as we can without sure. subjecting everyone to um, material non-public information. Right. Um, so, and yeah, we think that's critical. I, if without that, we, our sense is people don't have the purpose that they, that they need yeah. to be really inspired and, and do a good job. Right. Right, and really committed in owning something, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and we have very high employee retention. That's fabulous. Uh, you know, last year I wanna say we had 3% involuntary attrition, but that was a unique time. We were, you know, we'd just gone public. This year it's a little bit higher, but not much. Uh, and so we feel very lucky in that regard. Uh, we think that will creep up as we get bigger. Yeah. So we have to fight that. Mm -hmm. Uh, but certainly transparency and communication and alignment of vision are three of probably the top five things that we would focus on. Yeah. And, and, lear and training, learning and development. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess you're almost answering my next question, um, but it's about that. Tra you have been, I mean, CarGurus is just transforming constantly. It's a, because the, the growth is just so fast and things are changing all the time. And I think, you know, you have those stars and you, and you wanna keep them how do you keep them in that perpetu perpetual state of change? Like, how do you keep them motivated? Or is it just because it feels so good to be in a growth company and everything is going so well that, you know, yeah. just that alone is motivating enough? Yeah, yeah, I think the growth, you know, growth solves a lot of ills and mm -hmm. growth retains a lot of employees. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because uh, growth is, is an exciting, thing that does create change mm -hmm. just in and of itself. Mm -hmm. um, we have had some people, you know, not only grow, but also sort of slide over into new roles. Yeah. So, and, and we're, we're now spending more time on intercompany transfer uh, opportunities and, and making that a more fluid process because that's becoming a higher and higher interest. Uh, and then honestly, it's, it's with compensation, we've, started to do a better job at identifying key employees. Mm. You know, not just the high performers, but the key critical employees. And it's a, it's a relatively short list. It's a small percentage of the company who we want them to make, we wanna make sure that they know how important they are. Yeah, and that is, that is important, right? When they know that they really matter and they know that you know that they matter. That's, it goes back to the investment right. thing again too, right? On right. their side, they go, well, you're investing in me and I'm, yeah, and I'm recognized for it. Yep. So thank you, right? Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah, which goes to the, the whole commitment thing. So again, I'm just looking around. I wanna make sure um, if there's anyone in the audience. Nope. Any questions? There's is there someone? There. Good. I see a couple of them. So again, the light is in my eyes. So just wanna make sure I'm paying attention to all of you. Um, you're just talking about um, employees and kind of identifying who the key ones are and growing them. I'm interested across functions, are you, how are you measuring employees? Are you measuring, you know, finance versus their finance peers or trying to get a more general set of skills that you can measure finance versus engineering versus uh, 
you know, marketing or yep. some other function? Yeah, it's a great question because it's that's hard to do. So I would say we're about, well, we, we've, we're in a, in a period of transition to better calibration. So historically, it's been that, okay, as head of engineering, identify your top engineers, and as head of product, identify your top. Uh, and then within, related, but a little bit different, but, and then within that, we've developed career pathways for every single position in the company. Uh, and, so, and, and now everyone knows where they are on that pathway. Uh, and so uh, that allows us, that, that's one form of calibration. The identification of, of key employees, though, is still a little bit siloed. And so we've just started to identify a common set of requirements for internal promotions to director and VP that is now going to become an executive team discussion, whereas historically it was more of a functional leader with the CEO in this case. Uh, and uh, and for identification of key employees, we're also going to begin that, you know, sort of universal or horizontal calibration because what we have found is that some people promote faster mm -hmm. than others. And so you'll have an organization where, you know, call it inflated titles, call it whatever you will, but you've got, you know, a director who's working hand in hand with a VP. And after a while, the director says, hey, wait a second, this doesn't feel very right. Either, either I'm a VP or should be, or they're not a VP. Mm -hmm. uh, but, and so we have some of that that will take a while to work itself out, but we're doing everything we can so that we don't sort of worsen the problem and instead get more calibration. Great. Use your outside voice. How do we control quality of our product, of our actual product of the website and what we deliver to dealers? The, the actual farm. Uh -oh. oh, so we don't, yeah, so maybe I should have backed up to explain the business model. So we are simply an online marketplace. So we don't take ownership of the cars. We certainly don't manufacture cars. What we do is we um, have created a series of websites in various countries that allow, that have the largest inventory of cars from dealers and from individuals selling their cars uh, of anybody. For that largest inventory of cars from the largest install base of dealers, we then provide more information on the cars, the price of the cars, and the dealer reviews mm -hmm. and the dealers. And then with that information, we provide results back to a consumer in the most intuitive, uh, consumer-centric way. So the example I would give you is, if you were to search for a 2014 Audi A4 with 30,000 miles or less on our site, we would show you the cars that obviously fit that criteria, but are sorted by the best value to you, the buyer, mm -hmm. from the best dealers, whether the dealer is paying us or not. Our competitor sites will show you results for that same search in a way that gives you less information about the cars, doesn't tell you about the value of the car, and is sorted in a way that is driven by the dealers that pay them the most to put that car in the search result. So, uh, so that's our product, and our revenue model is we take, uh, we allow dealers to pay for subscriptions to get more access to, to tools and services on our site and get more connections to consumers on our site. So we have 85% of our revenue is dealer subscription revenue. Uh, how we control the quality of our website is through our engineering and product organization. And it's a highly iterative, agile environment where we're releasing code every day and uh, we tend to re release it in the afternoon, test it overnight, read the results in the morning and then, and then make the changes. And so uh, we're measuring the quality by the proof is in the pudding. If when we make a change or a feature upgrade, if it performed better that night than it did the night before, then odds are we're gonna we're gonna work to keep that. We'll get you a mic. 
Okay, so do you consider yourself a technology company or a data and analytics company or an online marketplace? What, what do you consider yourself? Uh, <laughs> we, uh, I would say a technology company would be the, the cleanest answer. It's a technology company that is, that, and we heavily leverage data analytics to create the user experience. Uh, and that, that has manifested itself into an online marketplace of the largest number of buyers and the largest number of sellers. And, and again, not to disparage, but to juxtapose, we view our competitors as they, the two largest in America happen to both be transitioned from media companies, sort of spun out of newspaper companies. Mm. So they're much more media oriented and a much bigger portion of their revenue is driven by advertising and by this classified concept from the newspapers where you, you pay to get your result placed higher. Ours is algorithmically more like, a, a great analogy is Yahoo and Google. When Yahoo was in the search game years, years ago, they adopted more of a listings or directory approach mm -hmm. and Google just said, that seems crazy, let's just give the result that's the best for the consumer and we'll measure that by the lowest bounce rate and how, how quality that result is for the search. That's the approach we've taken. And our, our belief is whoever wins the consumer is gonna win the dealer ultimately. Right. And they took an inverse approach, which is let's get the dealers to pay us and then we'll try and get the consumers. Um, you mentioned the, um, the five corporate initiatives that you go through every year and I was wondering, how do you come up with the initiatives? Is it tied to an overall corporate mission, vision? And then secondly, uh, do you, in your role, do you, do you um, hold people accountable to achieving those corporate objectives or do you do that as a, as a leadership team as a whole? So the way, we, uh, the way we've created them is we define them as initiatives that will, that will significantly increase enterprise value through either revenue or earnings, but revenue or strategic expansion in a two to four year time horizon and wouldn't get accomplished if not highlighted and attacked by a cross-functional group. So that's sort of the, how it even would get into the discussion. With that framework, we then, uh, we, we solicit input from the senior leadership team, which is about 25 people in total, VPs and above. And, uh, and then we have, so people submit, and there's an initial sort of voting process which ranks them. And then with that ranking, uh, we go through a series of discussions at offsites and otherwise. We do preparation work to understand, you know, what's entailed in that, the size of the opportunity, the level of difficulty, et cetera. And then we, it sort of culminates in a, in a couple day offsite, uh, in, typically in September, so it's sort of preparing for the next, next year, but we still have work to do after that in identifying what the five are. And then from there, we set the, the objectives and the metrics under each of them. Uh, and they really are, I mean, we actually went, we outlined them on our last earnings call. So they have really become for us a, a real anchoring point. Um, and uh, for what it's worth, we've had, the, the five we had in 2017 are the same five we have in 2018. We were a little self-conscious about that. We didn't know if we screwed up or were lazy, <laughs> but uh, that's not uncommon to have significant overlap, sometimes full overlap. Uh, and uh, and there's, there's now sort of universal buy-in. I don't think anyone on the team would think that we're missing any right now. I think we think we have the right five. In 2017, that wasn't the case, but now it is. Mike is coming. Um, just to bring it back to building great leaders, uh, you do a lot in terms of the upfront talent search and finding people who have leadership skills, but you may miss it once in a while. What do you do as far as improving the leadership? Is it the, do you do leadership training? Do you do things along communications, uh, listening skills? I would imagine that once in a while, uh, employees may want to disagree with their leader or manager, um, and what do you do to help foster 
that kind of growth within your organization? Just bringing it back, maybe concluding around building great leaders. Sure. So again, that's, that's one of the four pillars of our learning and development team is leadership development. And I would say that, that for that effort of leadership development, that is really targeting uh, first time managers and uh, of people and manager and director level specifically. And that's really blocking and tackling. I mean, it's, it's things like how to give feedback, how to give one-on-ones, how to listen better is, right. is actually one of our, <laughs> one, one of our courses, uh, how to mentor. Uh, and so it, it is just, you know, kind of raw education and classroom-based training as well as online-based based training. A lot of the content we create, some of it we don't. Uh, we have not, I would say, we have not cracked the code on uh, more senior leadership training yet. Uh, we know that that's an area where we haven't focused attention, but we want to. And I think the answer there is going to be uh, an outside partner that helps us with that. Uh, and so we're exploring ideas of coaches and of uh, you know teamwork consultants and uh, and you know if I'm if I'm honest I'd say that's probably taken a little bit of a back seat to what felt more like the burning building of the you know 50 or so managers that were first time managers mm. uh, but it's it's on our radar and and it's an investment and and uh, not everyone buys into it to be honest. In terms of you know when people disagree with their leader, uh, we we have adopted the the Amazon philosophy of disagree and commit. Uh, so we uh, will have a, a debate on a topic as a group, and we will we know we'll need to make a decision. And I think in most cases people feel comfortable enough to disagree, but we've all agreed that in the end of it, even if we do disagree, we're going to commit and. The good news for us is that we, tip, we tend to test and iterate so quickly that you're not actually committing to a lot. You, you may be committing to a two-week test, mm -hmm. and then, then you read the results. Uh, we give me an example, just so I make. So the people in the same department can cover each other's roles if you have turnover or if something expands, you have someone who can cover that role while they're still doing something else in a, you know, cross-training each employee to cover each other. Sure. Uh, we probably have not done much there in, L in learning and development specifically. We are doing more team uh, exercises that are both, um, you know, sort of business-related as well as social, and our view is that in doing that, it solves for the, the the gap issue that may occur. But no, we, we, we don't have any formal plans that say, make sure we have a, a backup in each role. We do recognize that we need better succession planning because we still have, again, having come from a company that was not a lot of people a few years ago, we still have a, a few people that hold a lot of keys. Uh, and and that's not healthy, and they know that, and, and so we need to, to do a better job with succession planning there and backfilling. So we probably only have a minute, so we have one more question, and then... I'll be very quick. Okay. Uh, Jason, you talked about in your hiring strategy when you went from, I think you said 150 to 600 employees, of hiring best athlete as opposed to people that had specific skills. And to me, it seemed like when you have high growth, you're hiring people that can't do the job on day one. It's kind of like changing a tire on the highway while you're going 50 miles an hour. But it seemed to have worked very well uh, for your company. Can you comment on what's the secret sauce? How do you make that work without having failures and disasters? Sure. I think it, at the individual contributor level, and, and in more role, in some roles more so than others, you do need to hire the person that can do that role that day. And, and there are certain areas where you just, it's an esoteric skill set and they need certain training and knowledge. And for those roles, yeah, we're, we tend to go with the, you know, the sort of safer bet, so to speak, that, so that we don't need to train them on the fly. Uh, my comment about uh, 
athletes was, was more around, I think, higher level and or management, uh, pe people managers, where, and the view is that when you combine that with, with work ethic, that even if in the first week they, they don't know what they're doing because they've never done it before, they've got intellectual curiosity and work ethic and they'll figure it out by week two. And, yeah. it, and it actually may not even be the, the orthodox way of doing it, but they could bring some new ideas. Great. So I, I always like to leave everybody with a takeaway. So okay. if you were gonna kind of sum it all up and just say what would be that thing, one magic thing that you can say to everyone about either creating the great leader or hiring, looking for them, you know, what's that secret sauce, as you put it, that you would say, you know, if you do this, or if you have a mindset about, you know, yep. what would that be? Yeah, I would say in a, in a growth environment, it's, it's, it's hiring for what things are gonna look like 12 months, 18 months ahead. And again, that makes the hire harder. You need to convince them harder. Uh, but it's, it's hiring ahead for that, and then not being shy about investing in training and rewarding it, uh, you know, continuing to train them and, and reward it. And those are, those are you know, penny-wise uh, investments that are sh it's short money, uh, and, it, and it pays in spades because when that is a 30-person organization instead of a three-person organization, if you don't have a good leader there, that's, that's going to become the house on fire. And, uh, and you can't keep putting out fires if you're growing fast. Excellent. Jason, thank you so much for spending thank time you. sharing your experience. Thank really you. Really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.